in person. Uh, as, as mentioned, joined Ryder just a few short months ago. So uh, personally, I think my immediate objective is just to learn. It's a um, uh, complex, vast industry. And uh, my last decade or so, I spent more on the passenger side of automotive transportation, dealing with some of the similar disruptors around EV, AV, digitization, uh, connected fleets, connected vehicles, and so on. Um, so as I come over into uh, this industry, I think it's personally just trying to absorb and, and meet more of you and, and learn uh, as, as quickly as possible. But flipping to the rider side, I think some of my early objectives are uh, focusing on t t two phases of, uh, of, of the area, really looking at our customers and, and trying to get as close to our customers as possible and understanding where they are in this evolution. It was great to see that poll come out to you. Um, right at the beginning, because that's a lot of my interest, is understanding where the customers that we work with are in this sustainability evolution, where they are from a readiness perspective, from an investment. So uh, my goal is to spend a lot of time there and really understand that side of, that side of it. Um, but uh, at the same time, is that better? But at the same time, spending a lot more time uh, with um, on the supply side and really working with our OEM uh, partnerships, working with some of the traditionals, non-traditionals. Riders in a unique position where we're able to connect both of those to our customers. We're able to deliver services and products where we meet the customer's needs and really understand where they are and connect them with those right uh, vehicles and asset solutions. So that's a lot of my focus initially is just to get my hands around uh, both of those sides. Yeah, well, uh, seems like an easy challenge, so. No problem. <laughs> And, uh, and, and Bob, um, you've been a, a little bit of a, I don't want to say, got to be careful how I say this, a bit of a journeyman at, uh, at Orbis, um, rise, rising up through the ranks. Um, tell us a little bit, very briefly, about your journey and kind of what your focus is, uh, is now at, at Orbis in your current role. Sure. So, yeah, my, uh, my journey with Orbis started about 10 years ago. Uh, it would have been 10 years in this past March. So... That was really my introduction to the automotive industry and learning the, the different trials as we came out of the, the Great Recession and, uh, and pulled things back up to the levels that uh, we, we've seen and have seen for up to these, these recent times. Um, but I think the, you know, the, the real challenge in the, in the role that I'm in now uh, is really around a lot of our new business development and uh, exploring into new markets. Uh, along with the, managing through our existing pieces of business and, and, and product management side of things. And and as we're going to be talking about here for the next hour, electrification to these vehicles is really that disruptor in the market and for our customers that, that leads to a lot of great changes and a lot of great opportunities. So very excited about what's to come here. Um, yeah, I think it's, we've transitioned from that piece of everyone wanting to get a lot of information to people are starting to do things with that information around EVs and, and how we continue to roll forward. So it's, it's an exciting spot to be in. Great. Well, thanks. And uh, yeah, obviously our panel is in the, certainly in the right place when it comes to electrification expertise. So let's uh, plow on. Um, developing a successful North American supply chain uh, and uh, electric vehicle industry, uh, as I mentioned, is going to be highly dependent on logistics and supply chain. Um, so what are some of the considerations uh, and, and, uh, from your perspective that will determine uh, North America's ability to achieve some of these uh, ambitious uh, goals, uh, ambitious and, uh, and important uh, electrification goals over the next five, 10 years um, as we move towards sustainable, uh, sustainable mobility? Um, Rob, I'll go to you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I look at it in three ways. Number one is cost. It's a lot of what we're seeing right now and, and, and the price of some of the offerings, some of the assets that are available. I think as technology continues to advance, as battery costs continue to go down, as uh, vehicle production continues to increase, I think we're gonna start to see some of those costs come down and, and, and be a little bit more achievable maybe for some of the customers. We're seeing a little bit of a sticker shock by some customers that are ready to jump in in the early phases. Um, so I think that's number one. Number two, just pure availability. I think for those customers that we work with that are ready to jump in and maybe are ready to make those investments and be those early adopters, uh, bringing actual solutions to them is, is also a challenge. It's uh, our, the, the suppliers, the manufacturers are facing some of the same challenges and just being able to deliver 
uh, uh, the vehicles as they work through some of their uh, internal innovation. So that's the second. Um, and then finally, uh, infrastructure. I think infrastructure is going to be key, and it's not the, the sexy topic that everyone wants to talk about. Everyone focuses more on the vehicles themselves. But I think infrastructure will be key. Uh, having the right uh, chargers, having the right uh, availability to the right chargers, and having the right build out in the right locations, um, and having all the scenarios around it, I think will be critical to make sure that um, this is a successful uh, rollout. Yeah, so certainly a few hurdles, uh, small hurdles to overcome before we reach those goals. But, um, Bob, turning to you, uh, from, from Orbis's perspective, what, what, are you, what are you seeing and um, how do you see that journey transpiring? Yeah, I agree with a lot of Rob's comments. I, I think the, that price equation is going to be a, a big one. Um, but I think it's also uh, one to add there is just around the experience. Uh, you know, as people are getting into the EV, the vehicle, um, it, the vehicles are different. There's a higher level of expectation for whether it's this, the digital monitors and screens are bigger and there's more opportunities to use more uh, electronic and video and those kinds of things. Uh, from our side, that means a more complicated supply chain. Those parts are more sensitive. They need to be transferred a little bit more carefully uh, than historically they have been. So uh, there's some changes to it. But I think that making sure they can live up to that expectation uh, on those new vehicles will be important. And I think probably in the, in the last piece of it is just making sure that we don't, we think the whole supply chain through. Um, on the e-vehicles, there's going to be that piece of what happens when that technology keeps leaping forward so quickly. What happens to those vehicles as they get passed by and the technology isn't there? Uh, you know, to be able to keep up with the latest and greatest, what happens to all of that material? How does that come back uh, into the supply chain or, or back through the supply chain into the waste stream? Yeah, absolutely. Some very fascinating points there and, and perspectives. Um, perhaps we should, when we talk about a transformation of the industry, we should look internally. Uh, it's not just what else everyone else is doing. Um, so let's I'll fire straight back to you, Jibob, and, and from Orbis's perspective, how are you transforming your, uh, your business, your models, um, as we gear up towards electrification? I, it, you know, for us, I, I hit on it a little bit at the beginning. It's, it's really that exciting period of, of what, is, what EV brings as changes. It allows us to, to bring new products uh, to, to market. You know, we've talked about a lot of ESD uh, we've, we've had a big focus on electrostatic discharge within our packaging to make sure that those pack those new parts that are coming in electric vehicles are going to be safe. We've had to get a lot better at uh, understanding and working with uh, different agencies. You know, you've got the, the lithium batteries. You got to be working with the DOT. You got to have you know specific certifications just to be able to do those transportation. Uh, of those parts and the packaging needs to be approved. So it's a different level for us than than what we've been doing uh, in your traditional ICE vehicles, but uh, it, is a, it is an exciting opportunity. And these are the types of things that right now it's uncomfortable because everyone is trying to kind of go fast and do things maybe a little bit differently. Um, but implementing some of that standardization, best practices, you know, those are things that, that we've been able to do uh, well in the past and, and look forward to getting to those opportunities again. Yeah, excellent. And, and Rob, even though you've only you've been with Ryder a, a short time in this role, um, internal transformation, um, are you already seeing things change in terms of the products that you've had in the past? And uh, again, how's that journey internally at Ryder? Yeah, absolutely. And again, not losing sight of the other side of the business and some of the traditional aspects um, have a significant footprint there. But as we shift into this space, I think some of the changes I've, I, I'm, I'm, I'm witnessing is just an evolution in offering new products and services. I think what, one of the things we're looking to do is not just solve the need for us, but solve it for our customers and be those consultants to the customers and how do we bring those right offerings to the customers. I think that's important. I think the other aspect of our current business is um, we spend a lot of time on maintaining assets and vehicles for our customers. Well, that's an evolution now in terms of what maintenance will look like on these EV vehicles. Bob, you mentioned complexity in the screens and the technology, and we're seeing that as well in terms of less moving parts, maybe mechanical, but a lot more technology on the uh, EV vehicles. So we're evolving as an organization, try to prepare ourselves there on how do we maintain those um, and how do we tool ourselves to uh, get our customers through it. 
Yeah, and, and the fact that you, you mentioned customers a, um, a fair bit there, you know, what are some of those conversations and, and can you share some insights uh, on those conversations you're having with your customers? Um, maybe not the commercial, or please yeah. do actually, but yeah. the, you know, wh I, how's the, how are those conversations developing and sure. again over time, is there a transformation in, uh, in expectations and um, yeah, how does that look? Yeah, so what we've seen is, um, and, and I rely on a lot of the history here on, on my, my peers at Ryder, but what, I, what I've been hearing is that our customers' conversations have evolved from just distant intrigue and interest to, all right, we're ready to jump in, we're ready to tip our toe in this. I don't really know where, I don't really know how necessarily, help to guide me through all the complexities of it. Again, the asset itself, the infrastructure, uh, grants and funding and incentives, very complex uh, area of this to try to offset some of those costs of the vehicles. So those are all conversations that we're having with our customers right now as they're ready to jump in. They hear all of the, all the media and all the availability of some of the vehicles that are coming, but really not fully understanding of where and how to jump into it. Mo many of them are, are in that boat. So uh, it's, it's really working with them to understand their specific use case, where it fits in. Most, of, most if not all, are not ready to jump all in and transfer their entire uh, fleet operation into uh, EV vehicles, but they're ready to start and really uh, in a progressive, I guess, in a, in a controlled way. And we're working with them to try to find those right early opportunities where they can have some of those learnings. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, and, and Bob, sort of same question to you. Uh, you know, is there greater urgency, greater demand from, from your customers? How have those conversations changed over the last year or so? Um, uh, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, they've they've changed. I think there's there's definitely some education that we can do and, and help customers along with from a from a you know the specific requirements of, of some of the EV EV vehicle uh, needs. But again, it really comes down to some of those core things that we've always done. It still comes down to you know cube utilization on their inbound freight, it, you know protecting the part, um, and making sure you've got good return systems and are using sustainable materials uh, in, within that packaging. Um, you know, even outside of e-vehicles, it's really gotten the supply chain has become so much more of a, of a data-driven source, and our reusable packaging and, and the industry's reusable packaging is really part of what's getting people that data. Uh, whether it's you know RFID tags or, or Bluetooth tags, different things on associated into our packaging that's driving some of that data. So those conversations are having uh, are happening. Uh, and continuing to to push along the conversation. So uh, it, there's definitely a bigger sense of urgency because those dates are, are getting closer and closer when things need to be delivered. Um, and, and resources on our customer side have not necessarily increased uh, as rapidly as, uh, as we like or, or make it comfortably. So we're, we're getting asked to do maybe a little bit more than we had two years ago. Yeah, I think, and to, to add to that, one of the other pieces that we're also seeing is our customers' customers are starting to have those conversations where they're pushing them to show a plan, uh, progress, or some aspect of uh, uh, EV presence. So we're hearing it that way as well in terms of customers coming to us saying, help me, help me to get through this transition because the, my customers that I'm working with are looking to have that sense of presence through us. So um, there's also a secondary too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you talked about resources there and something we've heard uh, a lot already and we'll no doubt hear for, uh, throughout the rest of the, the conference as well um, about material supply. So whilst that demand is starting to increase from your customers for your products uh, and, and solutions, um, I'd be interested to know how are your own supply chains and, and your, how has your own ability uh, been impacted um, your ability, that is, to uh, fulfill on demand for electrification products and, and materials. I'll go to you, Rob. Um, yeah, and I, I, th I think we've touched on a lot of it. Um, obviously, the immediate demand is on the vehicles themselves, and as, as we work with our partnerships on any number of classes or types of vehicles, I think it's a matter of 
having the right solution available to the customers, and that's not always there. It's they're, they're, they have a specific need today, and the, the expectations are maybe not realistic where they're coming to us and looking to, for us to deliver a solution, and that solution may be months or sometimes years out from reality in terms of being able to deliver that, so working through the, uh, our relationship and having a more of a realistic timeline. I think the other supply uh, challenge that we're also seeing is on the chargers themselves. Again, it's the other uh, piece of the equation, just to make sure that we can start working with our customers and preparing them for when those vehicles do land and they're able to kind of uh, run parts of their business on the EV platform they have the operations and the infrastructure ready for it, and that's not always as readily available as we would like it there. So that's, that's having a challenge as well. So just both sides of those uh, solutions from a timing perspective. Mm. And, and Bob, again, same to you in terms of that capacity and your ability to fulfill on uh, customer, customer demand. Sure. Uh, you know, I think like everybody, we, we're having supply chain issues and interruptions, whether it's uh, materials, uh, whether it's labor, uh, whether it's logistics of moving things around when they are ready to go, everybody is is experiencing that. Uh, it's forced us to get pretty creative. Uh, you know, we, we've uh, been able to, from a you know, it started with material availability, whether you had storms and, and availability of resins, and uh, we were quickly able to react and, and increase our buyback of, of using packaging that's been out in the system. We've set records uh, over the course of the year to just make sure we have material available. Uh, Labor-wise, whether it's continuing to, to look at ways to automate things, um, but labor has definitely been an issue. Um, but I think it's forced us to be creative and have probably deeper and, and more uh, upfront conversations with our customers to understand exactly what they need. I think you know, we heard it a lot in the prior session around everybody kind of adding inventory throughout the supply chain to make sure that everybody's going to have enough. Um, that's a difficult position to put us, put us in to make sure that we're balancing what is that customer really need versus what are they saying they need and in the timing of that so we can keep multiple customers happy uh, and, and on time versus, uh, you know, trying to sort through what those, what the padding of the uh, inventory is. That makes makes sense. Makes complete sense, yeah. So um, I can see that the, uh, the votes are still coming in on the poll, so I'm going to let that run a little bit longer, but um, I'll just take the opportunity um, to, to, to say that you know, there is an opportunity to ask our experts here on the, on the panel with me um, those uh, all important and very challenging questions, so uh, do challenge them. Uh, we do encourage you to get involved, whether it be um, here in the room or uh, on, uh, online as well. So um, perhaps something... Uh, Perhaps something we, we should uh, turn to now is some of the, the, the differences between ICE and in EV supply chains. Um, I think there's been a, a reasonable amount of uh, conversations around this um, over the last year or two, but are there any particular things that are coming to the fore, uh, maybe things that haven't been, uh, that, w that weren't sort of seen as some of the biggest obstacles or the challenges or the differences that would make a difference in supply chain and, and logistics? Um, that uh, we can see from this emergence um, where the challenges are starting to lie and, and we should take note of. And Rob, I'll, I'll go to you on that. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as far as uh, differences between them, I think for us it's, um, we're addressing areas of the traditional ICE uh, vehicles and assets and we're spending a lot of time and focus on that and, and looking at things like uh, uh, connected fleet and data and uh, digitization and automation and really better decisioning through um, data modeling. So we're looking at it that way, but we absolutely expect that to translate nicely into the EV and AV space into some of the disruptors that are coming. So we're maybe addressing them a little bit separately right now, um, but we absolutely expect that to um, meet both of our needs. So that's... Yeah, great. And uh, yeah, Bob, your your thoughts on that? The sort of some of the key differences, and um, sure. I guess, the, yeah, yeah, I, I hit on them earlier. It really comes down to you know with with the transportation of the batteries. That's a different requirement than than what we've done in the past. Um, so working much closer with the DOT and the different applications to make sure that the packaging is approved, uh, and then you've got the just increased amount of electronics going in uh, that just requires a different level of 
of, of protection. Um, a lot of those parts are a lot more expensive than the parts that they, you know, replacing in a com- when you compare it to what's would be in a traditional ICE vehicle. Um, so that that is driving a, a little bit different level of materials and planning that needs to go around it. Um, those would be the two biggest drivers of the changes uh, for us. Yeah. To add to that, I think one of the things that, that Bob touched on that uh, sparks a thought is in terms of just life cycle, just vehicle life cycle management in terms of the, the turnover of that vehicle and the, the, the maintainability and the maintenance of the, of the components throughout the life of the vehicle. I think those are some of the differences that we're monitoring. I think there's a lot of unknowns in what this will look like on the EV side, but it's definitely something that we're keeping an eye on as a, as a difference. Excellent. And um, so uh, the audience has answered my call, and we have a couple of questions come in. So um, uh, they always say, be careful what you wish for. Um, but the first one, um, a lot of new EV businesses are, are startups where FCST and volumes are unknown um, for unreli- uh, or unreliable. Um, how are you partnering with these businesses to support them on their journey? Um, that's open to the panel, so um, I'll go with you, Rob. Yeah, and I, I think it's uh, controlled innovation, I guess. It's, it's, uh, uh, we're definitely spending time with our more established uh, OEM, larger partnerships and some of that transition, but in no way are we ignoring some of the innovation that's coming up from uh, some of the smaller, maybe riskier uh, startup companies out there. Uh, knowing that there's there's a certain level of risk you sign up for and just doing the due diligence and trying to understand where they fit into the picture and what their long-term possibility, I guess, is in terms of what they can continue to offer. So sometimes looking at, at those startups for a specific discrete piece of the solution, knowing that that'll likely be then absorbed or evolved through other relationships. So definitely... Um, evaluating, but cautiously uh, rolling out our footprint with some of those riskier ones, obviously, um, to, to, to manage some of those learnings, but manage some of the risk to, to us and our customers. Excellent. And yeah, same, same to you, Bob, in terms of how are you supporting um, those customers, be they traditional um, or startups in the EV space? Yeah, I think that the startups have been exciting for us because they've come at, you know, from a packaging side of things, looking at it with a fresh, fresh lens. You know, they don't have the, the years and years of, of going through this process with other vehicle launches. So, you know, a great example, we worked with one that, you know, we've been able to incorporate ocean bound materials into our packaging, uh, not sacrifice any of the performance. Um, but incorporate materials that just from a cost standpoint in the past with would have been, you know, would have kept us from even considering those. So um, that's just one of the examples of uh, kind of that fresh look and how they view things is, is exciting for us because it's an opportunity to kind of play and, and learn things and then be able to take it to the, to the greater masses in the, in the overall market. Excellent. And uh, uh, there's another question that's come through, and this one's for you, uh, Rob, so I'll put you in the hot seat. So, is Ryder trying to leverage EV truck push, the EV truck push, to possibly improve driver recruiting and retention, maybe a younger population? That's interesting. Obviously, drivers, and from our perspective, technician and just overall worker shortage challenges. Um, everywhere. I think we're looking at... Um, yeah, I mean, possibly EV. Um, we're also looking at the AV space as well and where that fits into the overall ecosystem in terms of driver availability and be able to maybe supplement some of those, some of those gaps. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 an interesting, it's an interesting thought. I think it's uh, from a, from a uh, technology, I think Bob touched on it earlier in terms of just the adoption of the technology and the complexity of, of some of the, these vehicles. I think we're looking at how to trans, transfer the skills and knowledge of the existing drivers. I think, yes, absolutely opens the door for a new level of talent to come in. But at the same time, also the, the maintainability and the management of those vehicles, I think it's also something we're looking at, the, not just the drivers, but also those that are maintaining those assets from a, uh, maybe a different talent pool. Yeah, interesting. And I think, yeah, from a, 
a generational um, standpoint, um, it could be a fantastic way of attracting new talent into the, into the industry, um, younger generations. Um, I put myself in the older generation. Um, young, younger generations, uh, sustainability and, and um, green ethics and uh, these, these types of things are becoming more prominent, more important, um, uh, more so than um, you know, money and, and things yeah. like that and remuneration. So it could be a, a way of accessing these. Yeah, and I'll add to that maybe a real example where recently we ran a a pilot on an, uh, some EV uh, yard tractors and um, the feedback we got from the, the, the drivers utilizing the equipment were spectacular. They were, they were ecstatic around just the ease of use, the comfort, the, the noise, everything else that came with it. So it just, it was such a, such a better experience for them utilizing these assets. So I think absolutely that opens up the door for others, not just in that space, but other uh, EV capabilities. Yeah. yeah, excellent. So I mentioned the poll earlier, so I do, uh, I don't want to forget about that. So um, if, my, uh, if my colleagues could bring that up on, uh, on the screen, we can have a look at uh, how, you've been, uh, how you've been voting. Um, so we asked uh, what percentage of your current automotive business was uh, dedicated to electric vehicles, less than uh, 25%, 25 to 50%, over 75%, or, or, oh, I've mixed up my numbers there, apologies. Lots of percentages there. So let me stand up and actually be able to read something rather than guess, um, just so we can bring you into the, uh, the picture there, Rob. So what percentage of your automotive business is dedicated to electric vehicles? Um, so Currently, less than 25%, 75% of the audience, so a vast majority of you are still in that information gaining uh, phase, still looking to, uh, to ramp up. Um, those of you who are over 75, just a mere, 70, uh, it's just a mere 7%, um, and I promise this will be the last time that I talk about percentages and polls. Um, before I get myself too muddled. Uh, but yeah, I think what, we, what we're seeing there is a, a clear indication that it's very much the start of the journey. I mean, is that a surprise? Not at all. I'm probably more surprised by the 51 to 75 percent. Um, I'd love to be able to see that number on where you think you need to be two to three years from now. I'd love to see that, that shift and evolution as far as not just where we are, but where the push is right now, where the demand is from the customer perspective, but not surprised by the, the larger number. We can certainly find out at uh, Automotive Logistics and Supply Chain Global next year when we ask exactly the same question with you in the hot seat. So, <laughs> um, Bob, are you surprised by that number or th those figures, if you could understand me? I, I think I followed. Uh, I guess I, it'd been interesting, maybe even going back the other way, what was it two years ago? You know, it, looking at how far has it changed, and, and I think it, it, to Rob's point, where is it going to be in three years is going to be, you know, that those numbers will keep to increase on the upper end of it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it will be fascinating to get that data. And I'm sure that's something that our uh, business intelligence team um, we, is pulling together and uh, we'll be able to, to share those insights. So a little plug there for the team back home. Um, Let's, uh, let's talk about fleets. And um, yeah, going to you, Rob, what are some of the barriers holding back electrification of fleets? I think we've touched on a few of them, but um, you, you talked about uh, your customers starting to dip their toe in the water. Um, so talk us through a little bit of detail about the transition. Um, you know, these are significant investments that are required. Um, so how are you supporting and, and what does that journey look like? Yeah, and, and uh, the obvious one is one of the big hurdles we need to help our customers overcome is the cost aspect naturally, where especially on the larger, if you look at class eight uh, vehicles and, and so on, the, the, the price tag uh, currently is probably a, a little higher than many customers are willing to jump into. So I think it's, it's helping them to overcome and offset some of those costs and really looking at it from a, a TCO perspective and looking at it for uh, you know, what, what other ways we can supplement and offset some of those costs through grants and federal and state and, and, and so on. And we have, a, we have, we have a, a, a team at Ryder that's just focused and dedicated on helping our customers to, to, to overcome some of those challenges um, uh, and get them there. So I think those would be some of the, some of the challenges. 
I, I think the, you know, obviously a challenge is just around um, uh, uh, timing, uh, timing and just being able to deliver the solutions in the given time that they're, they need to be able to deliver them, I, th I think is going to be a challenge to continue to push that along. And then as I mentioned in the past, uh, previously is just around just the infrastructure readiness for them and just getting them ready there to, 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 to prepare for that aspect. Yeah, well, perhaps we could delve a little bit deeper on that uh, infrastructure side. Um, you know, are, are your customers set up for, for the charging, for smart charging? You know, is this a, and you mentioned it's unsexy, um, you know, it's very debatable for our audience, but, uh, you know, maybe you could delve a little bit deeper in, into that and, again, what those kind of conversations you're having look like and how you're helping prepare and, and what people do need to prepare for rather than just going, right, we'll flip a switch and we'll go full electric. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's, it's part of it is location based and part of it is the relationship with the local utilities and, and grids and, and just availability of, of power and just there's, there's a huge variance in terms of the time to solution uh, based on the specific use case, based on type of chargers they need, based on how many chargers they need, based on where they are and there's just such a great variability. So we're having those initial conversations with customers and they hear a uh, uh, a 12 to 18 month time, time frame in some scenarios, uh, that definitely comes off as a, as a shock to them in terms of just, just not just looking at from a financial investment in terms of the cost of the infrastructure, but just the time, the, the, the build out, the construction part of it, just the, the investment part of it in the timeline. I think those are some of the surprises, I'd say, to our customers that maybe they weren't uh, re ready for where their focus was more around, um, let's see the type of vehicle and when I can get a vehicle in my fleet and where, where it makes sense. So I think that's, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a time surprise that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, well, Bob, turning, turning to you, and uh, as we talk about electrification, it, it's with a clear goal to a sustainable future. So uh, clearly the products and solutions coming out to support electrification in turn need to be sustainable. So how much are you having to uh, innovate and, and adapt your own products, your solutions, and, and as, well, while you're doing that at pace, does that add another layer of complexity? It, it can. I, I think, fortunately, for, for Orbis and, and, and our reusable packaging strategy, it's always been uh, around using sustainable materials, whether that material can be um, designed to be reused and can last for you know hundreds, if not thousands, of trips. And then at the end of its useful life, it can be brought back and we can turn it into the next. We can recycle and, and reuse that material right back into the packaging. So from a sustainability story, we're very well positioned to, to play into that. Um, and we've also, I mentioned it before, um, even being able to utilize even more strains of material uh, outside of what we traditionally have used and incorporating that into our packaging uh, to help with that sustainability story. Uh, even with customers outside of the automotive industry, uh, that's been a big piece is you know, one-way plastic and different things uh, and, and just one-way packaging in general uh, has kind of a negative connotation around it. So how much more reusable packaging you can get into, uh, whether that be plastic, whether that be metal, whether it be you know, injection molded or thermoforming, different, uh, different processes, um, you know, we're able to cover a, a lot of different materials and look at things uh, unbiasedly and not try to just uh, jam a solution down uh, onto somebody and, and really do what's best for the application and, and for that story. Yeah. And so it's my understanding from our, from our audience and from what you're saying so far, we're, uh, we're very much at the beginning, um, uh, the early stages of this, uh, of this journey. Um, and what we're going to require is, is scaling up uh, and at pace. And challenges that come with rapid, uh, rapid growth and scaling up at pace um, can, le can lead to inefficient practices uh, and operations. So uh, perhaps looking at a wider scale, you know, what are some of the considerations um, that logistics leaders, supply chain leaders, and their teams need to consider? Um, and what do they need to do to, uh, to avoid their supply chains becoming inefficient um, and so they can remain competitive? I'll go to you, Bob. Yeah, I think, I think from us, it, it, it's always that key of making sure you take the time to get all those 
all those pieces of your supply chain together uh, as you're going down these kinds of major changes and, and major disruptions now, but major changes and make sure you're, you're looking at it from beginning to end to make sure that you're, you're not making efficiency decisions at one point that are going to hurt and make it and you're going to lose all those efficiency gains as it, as it moves down the system. And so it's really that open communication is really key to make sure that as, as things ramp up and, and, and move through the system, uh, hopefully at much larger levels, you know, I think everybody's goal is to, if you're starting small, you want to grow to be big and uh, how do you ramp those things up? But it, it's really got to have that communication and that planning stages in there to make sure that that you're keeping everyone together and, and everyone's understanding the full picture of the, of the goals and projects uh, that you're rolling through. Yeah, to, to, to add to that, I, I think, you know, I love the beginning to end visibility. I think that's, that's a great point. I think it's um, for us looking at specific use cases that make sense. It doesn't make sense in every scenario today. And I think identifying where, the, where it does make sense for those specific uh, learnings and rollouts, I think can help to minimize some of the, some of the chaos and some of the, um, some of the disruption that comes from the pace of change right now, where it's more of a controlled, focused, specific use case that our customers are looking to solve and implement with these new technologies. Yeah, absolutely. And is there, a, is the pressure on in terms of return on investment? Um, as we mentioned, you know, with electrification, new product solutions often comes a significant investment requirement. Um, return on investment is always key. Sure. And these last couple of years, we've seen that the return on investment has to be, you know, the, the time period is shortening. Um, no longer can you start out on a five-year project, perhaps. Um, we're going less than 12 months, six months, three months even, we're hearing. So in terms of electrification, it has to be a little bit more patient and it has to be a little bit of a, a, a longer game played here. Yeah, and I, and I think there's an obvious cost of learning, cost of innovation that some of the early adopters have to understand they're walking into. So it, it, uh, I, th I think that's just putting that on the table from the beginning. But I think one of the things we've done both internally for Ryder and, and for our customers is we've developed... Uh, a, a TCO model, a TCO calculator that allows us to evaluate all the different facets of this. So it looks at the vehicles, look at, looks at the incentives, looks at the uh, uh, fuel, uh, maintenance cost, all the other components with it, and we overlay that against some of those, some of those scenarios that customers are, are bringing to us and trying to see what makes sense, what we think financially would make sense and what the, what the uh, uh, cost or, or, or break even or, or, or ROI on that could be based on some of those variables. So I think we're looking at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't always come out that way, and that, that's part of those, those upfront costs right now. Again, it's, it's the, 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 the early phase of this technology that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. I want to turn my attention to another question that's come through from the audience. There are a couple of questions, so I'm keen to, keen to address those. Um, what types of data and visibility are new EV and existing OEM tier customers looking for in their supply chain? Can you utilize trucks, trailers, and packaging to deliver data or improve supply chain? I'll, I'll go to Bob. Uh, absolutely. I think we're seeing this more and more uh, across all of our industries that we play in that the, the data uh, is, is needed and is being asked for from the supply chain and uh, that reusable packaging where the devices that are needed to generate the data are, are you know, too expensive or, or limited if you're if you're putting it on a one-way package. But if that package is going to make you know hundreds of trips through your system, you can justify adding some additional cost uh, to be able to get and, and drive that information. It's been a great tool, whether it be RFID, whether it G GPS on, on specific loads. We've we've worked on a number of different projects that can. Uh, can drive that data. And I think it's just becoming more and more before I'd say two, three years ago, it was probably done in pockets. Uh, now it's pretty well accepted uh, across that, that the packaging that you're going to purchase is going to have some sort of uh, transmitter on it to, to give more data and more uh, insight into where the supply chain is at any one given point. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And, and Rob? 
Yeah, and we're, data is huge for us. So we're looking at data both from the, the vehicle and the trailer. And one of the new pieces of data that we're working through and trying to understand how we can get it and how we can use it is the charger infrastructure data as well. So looking at that from a software perspective. So then if you look at the overall fleet management aspect of it and you look at utilization and look at um, uh, routes and you look at what you're learning around how you're using those assets and how and when you're charging them and, and really looking at as a way to optimize uh, your operations. I think those data components are, are critical to us. So we're, we're aggregating many of those today. We're making significant investments in data science and just trying to, trying to understand how we can take advantage of that, again, to help our customers um, uh, optimize their investments. Yeah, excellent. And, and another question, and um, perhaps we touched on it previously, but do you think uh, the infrastructure changes will stay on pace with the EV revolution? Um, so you talked a little bit about um, infrastructure requirements. Um, and perhaps I can build on that and say, where are those infrastructure investments going to come from? Are they going to come from the public sector? Are they going to come from private? Is it going to be the companies invested in electric vehicles that are going to be leading the charge, pun intended, um, to, uh, to upgrade uh, and install the, the necessary infrastructure? Um, yeah, I th think it's probably a combination. I think what we're seeing is uh, there's a facility aspect of the charging infrastructure. Many of our customers don't own the uh, the the land uh, where they are um, they are on. So just understanding how the charging infrastructure fits into ownership model and and th those physical locations, I think that's part of it. Part of it, we're looking at charging infrastructure at different routes or different locations. Our facilities, for example, in terms of what that looks like from vehicles coming in and out and they're coming in for maintenance. Well, what does the charging infrastructure need to be when you're performing certain services on these vehicles? So where they need to be? I think it's, it's, it's probably a, a combination. And obviously our customers are investing in some of that infrastructure themselves within their own uh, locations. Um, I just think it's, it's uh, in scale, it's going to take some time to really get the get the larger footprint that's going to be necessary to support this. Yeah. Bob, anything to add there? I, this doesn't have to do a whole lot with the packaging of this, but I, I do think it's a very interesting topic. I do think it will gate how quickly and how widespread, especially when you talk about getting out of fleet vehicles and just into every you know personal use vehicles, how quickly people can convert. I, it's, it's really going to influence a lot over the next five to ten years how quickly things can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to, uh, coming to a close for this session. Um, time's absolutely flown by, um, certainly for me and I'm sure for our audience too. Um, but I want to round up with a, a couple of questions in terms of you know, what's coming next. Um, so. Bob, I'll go to you first. And, you know, what can we expect from, from Orbis and, uh, over the next coming years that we perhaps haven't talked about? And how do you see that evolution of your products and services, um, again, as, as the electrification journey picks, picks up pace? Yeah, I hit on them a little bit already, but I, I think it's going to open up for us you know, more materials to use. You know, we, we already are... Um, spread across, you know, we use a, a lot of different materials in our packaging, but I think with the unique requirements of EV vehicles, there's going to need to be an evolution and we're going to need to continue to evolve there. Um, and I think into the tracking, uh, it's going to become more and more important uh, as these, a lot of those parts are more, well, either they're regulated, so the government's going to require some sort of understanding of where those parts are or where they have been and how they've been handled. But then also just from the value of those materials, it's going to be cost justified to make sure you've got uh, better insight and visibility to those parts as they're going uh, to the OEMs to be, man to be used in the manufacturing process. So, um, you know, I think it's going to be an exciting couple of years as we continue to evolve and try to ramp up. And um, it's fun to see the continued investment, you know, it's almost weekly, if for sure monthly, if not weekly, you know, more and more investment coming into this space that's going to continue to change this as people push things forward. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the fact that there's excitement, um, we've had a, 
uh, necessary, but a lot of doom and gloom um, so far already about the challenges, the pitfalls, um, the, the struggles that uh, are so well documented and, and have been covered already. So great to hear some optimism and, and some excitement from you there. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, turning to you, Rob, we're seeing more and more light and, and medium-sized uh, vehicles uh, and trucks on the road, uh, electric vehicles, that is. Um, how far away from, are we seeing uh, heavy trucks um, turning to electric modes? And uh, yeah, what, is that, what does that future look like and when is that future? Yeah. The crystal ball. Um, yeah, it, we're seeing, we're definitely on the light duty uh, vehicles, probably more near term from what we're seeing right now with some of the relationships and just uh, availability, some of the production capacity that, that we're seeing coming up right now, that's more near, near term uh, in terms of payload, range is starting to make more sense, costs are starting to make more sense. So I think that's a very, very immediate near term solution, uh, assuming some of the supply challenges can be overcome. But um, on the heavy duty vehicles, a lot of what we're hearing, a lot of what we're seeing from our partnerships is, you know, one, two, three years out, a few years out in any type of uh, scale. Again, we're, we're, we're piloting, we're looking at them, we're trying to understand where and how it fits in, but I think that's on the heavy duty from at least broader landscape, we're seeing it a little bit further out where the light duty vehicles and the yard tractors and the vans and some of those other capabilities I think are uh, more immediate solutions that we're looking to put in place with our customers. Fantastic. Well, excitement and opportunity, great notes to end upon. Um, thank you very much uh, to both my uh, virtual and in-person panel. So, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.